وسهلاً بكم في برنامج داخل واشنطن أنا مضيفكم روبرت ساتلوف إذا كنتم تعتقدون عن الانتخابات الرئاسية لن تزداد غرابة أو جنوناً فأنتم مخطئون في ولاية نيفادا أجرى الجمهوريون مؤخراً انتخاباتهم التمهيدية وفي الحقيقة كانت هناك عمليتان انتخابيتان الأولى منحت أسوات المندبون المؤتمرهم الوطني وحاز دونالد ترامب فيها على 99 من الأسوات وأما الثانية كانت مجرد تسويت الشعبية لم يشارك ترامب في عملية الانتخابات الثانية بل ترك الساهة للحاكم السابق لولاية ساوث كارولينا نيكي هيلي المرشحة الأبرز على قائمة المرشحين وكان توقعت نيكي هيلي الفوز بسهولة لعدم وجود منافسين لكنها خسرت وهذا خيار لا أحد من المرشحين على ضعف الأسوات التي حصلت إليها كيف يستطيع دونالد ترامب تحدي المنطق السياسي بكسب جولات الانتخابات المتتالية مع العلم أنه أحد القداء أمره بدفع 400 مليون دولار كرسوم كانونية وكيف يواصل جو بايدن الحصول على نتائج منخفضة في أركام التسويت الوطنية رغم تحقيقه واحدة من أفضل النتائج في الفترة الرئاسية الأولى في البيت الأبيض منذ فترة طويلة لبحث موضوع انتخابات أم 2024 الغريبة والجنونية يسرني أن أستضيف نخبة من المراقبين ومحللين السياسيين إلين غونفري، جيكوب رباشكين، وكايل كونديك Welcome back to Dachl, Washington. Well, the clock is ticking toward our presidential election in November 2024, one of the oddest, strangest, weirdest campaigns in American history. To help explain some of the oddities, I'm delighted to welcome Elaine Godfrey, Kyle Kondik, and Jacob Rabashkin. So, Kyle, can you help our viewers understand someone they're probably not um, familiar with? Who is special counsel Robert Herr? And what did he say that was so damning to Joe Biden's re-election prospects? Uh, Robert Herr is a special counsel appointed by the uh, Attorney General Merrick Garland, who's a Democratic, you know, Biden appointee. And um, Herr was looking into uh, this Biden's retention of classified documents after he left um, the vice presidency. Uh, Herr decided not to press charges against Biden. Of course, there are charges against Trump for sort of similar uh, in, in sort of similar circumstances. But her in, in the event of his or in his report uh, took a lot of shots at Biden's age, basically, and basically was sort of adding fuel to this this already burning fire about, you know, concerns about Biden's ability to lead. Democrats thought that basically this what he put in the report was was inappropriate um, and, and over the top. Um, but, you know, if you look at polls, you know, people do seem fairly concerned about Biden's age and his ability to do the job. And so this report kind of uh, added to some of those concerns, whether it actually impacts the election, I, you know, certainly remains to be seen. But it was a, a kind of exhausting negative headline for the Biden White House. An elderly gentleman with memory problems, something like that. Jacob, a huge per percentage of Americans think that Joe Biden is too old to run again. But this hasn't actually propelled the candidacy of other Democrats who are competing against him. Biden is winning those votes quite handily. What's the dynamic here? There are a couple of things going on that explain why Biden is still uh, the clear consensus Democratic uh, favorite front runner, uh, almost certain nominee for president, right? The first is that he's still popular among Democrats. 
the voters who uh, are the kind of people that show up for Democratic primaries, the most dedicated Democratic voters, like Joe Biden. His approval rating among Democrats is in the 70s and 80 percent, which is not perhaps the numbers we saw with Trump uh, in the Republican Party four years ago, but is still uh, high and explains why uh, he he is is in such strong position within the party. The other thing that's happening, of course, is that no strong Democrats have stepped up to challenge him. There are a number of compelling, well-funded uh, Democrats out there on the national stage, governors, senators, people like that. All of them passed on the opportunity to run against Joe Biden. The only person who threw their hat in the ring is Dean Phillips, who is a, a third term congressman from Minnesota who had no base, has no uh, real reach beyond the Twin Cities region and has been struggling accordingly to gain any sort of traction. So Biden is very popular among Democrats still and uh, no major Democrats stepped up to challenge him. And you put those two together, you have a recipe for a glide path to the nomination. So Elaine, why does Donald Trump 77 and overweight, get a pass on the fitness for office question. But Joe Biden, 81 and in reasonably, apparently good health, suffer from that perception. That's a very good question. Um, I think it's it's more just that the people who love Donald Trump love him in in almost a, a sort of obsessive, sort of cult-like way. I mean, the, the, the base of the Republican Party loves Donald Trump, there is almost nothing uh, that he could do or say that would get them to change their minds about that. Um, I, I think, and as we've seen with his, you know, 91 felony counts against him, which we'll probably talk about later, but um, I, I think, frankly, also, when Trump is on the trail, we haven't seen him trip multiple times. I think he is still a, a better speaker than Biden is. Biden does show his age when he speaks. Um, he takes a long time. He stumbles literally and 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 verbally. Um, and, and I think it's just more obvious. Um, he is older. Um, is he probably on paper a lot healthier than Trump? Yes, probably. Um, but but I think that that's just something that um, we it's just easier to observe and to be honest about. Um, I, I think that but again, Biden is very uh well liked among his base as well. So I'm not sure. I mean, th these age questions are going to come down um, to moderate voters, to independent voters, um, because the base of each party uh, isn't really taking them into account, it, it seems like. It, you know, Trump, Trump's base voters are not knocking him for his age, just like Biden's base voters aren't as well. So, Kyle, th there's, um, uh, there's quite a lot of um, 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 uh, an effort around Biden to be quite protective of the president. Uh, we saw not even allowing him to do uh, the traditional easy Super Bowl interviews that presidents do uh, every year. Um, uh, you know, what's your favorite team? What's your favorite halftime snack? I mean, the easy questions. I do think that the president probably would be, be well served by being out there a little bit more. But part of the, the problem is that, you know, even, even when he was younger, he was someone who was known for making a lot of verbal gaffes, for misstating things, for occasionally em embarrassing himself. And so, you know, those problems are only, I think, exacerbated by age. And so I, I do think he probably should get out there a little bit more. It's just that from the White House perspective, it's like, well, if you do that, you might, you might, uh, uh, make some more mistakes and contribute even more to this uh, this this problem about about his age and just the questions about his his his, his, his ability to serve. So, uh, you know, I, I do think it's important for Biden to get out there a little bit more than he has. Although it's not like he's not doing any events. I mean, he does have. You know, he has been making campaign stops and official stops in, in states all over the country. Um, you know, there is a dynamic that some people have noted that, you know, on one hand, people are saying, hey, he's not doing anything. He's got to do more. But then he does actually do stuff and it doesn't necessarily get a whole lot of a uh, whole lot of attention. Uh, Jacob, I, I agree with Kyle generally that the president would probably be better served 
getting out there more, but also he is out there in, in certain venues that are more comfortable for him. He gives a speech about manufacturing. It feels like every week at a union hall or a factory or something to that effect. Um, you know, I, I think the problem that the Biden white house is facing is that because the narrative has set in about the president's age and his verbal stumbles, uh, any little piece of evidence that, uh, comes out of any of his appearances is going to uh, get added to the the pile of of evidence that voters are looking at and, and assessing his his capability to serve. I mean, look at the press conference he gave following the release of the her report that evening. He talked with reporters for a very long time, and the headline out of that press conference was that in one instance he mistakenly referred to the president of Egypt as the president of Mexico. And that was held up as, you know, an example of, oh, he, he's he's slipping a little bit. He's lost his fastball. So uh, I, I think they're they're in a bit of a bind, but I do agree that the only antidote at this point to the narrative that Biden is too old, that he's not up for the task, is to show that he is up for the task, that he can go toe to toe with reporters, with adversaries. Um, if you recall uh, last year's State of the Union or two years ago's State of the Union, uh, there was a very combative moment between him and the Republicans in the House and Senate. And that was held up as a great moment for Biden, that he went toe to toe with his Republican opponents. So the more opportunities he can do that publicly, I think the better he'll be served uh, on these questions of age and fitness. And this is what I wanted to ask you about, Elaine. What do you think is the is the message that Joe Biden would like to leave in the minds of the millions of Americans? So Biden has a unique problem before him, which is that um, he is very unpopular despite the economy being pretty strong. Um, I think voters are still facing high interest rates, high prices. Um, and so, and I think immigration is shaping up to be a real issue. Voters are seeing, um, you know, cable news covering migrants flooding the border, but also people sleeping on the street in Chicago and in New York City. Um, I think that these are big issues that it would be really good to hear uh, Biden address, Biden talk about. Um, I think it is important, as Jacob and Kyle were saying, that he you know, project strength on this issue. I think a lot of people don't, or on these issues, um, I think people see him, uh, a recent polling I think has shown that people don't trust that he is able to address the immigration uh, issue in this country. People don't trust that he has the economy under control. He has to project, you know, strength and optimism and positivity and just like a general vibrancy. He, his administration has accomplished a lot um, in, in its first, uh, in his first term. Um, I think that, I think he should tout those, although we know that despite all these accomplishments, he remains very unpopular. Um, I think he just needs to keep hammering hammering home his accomplishments and sound as confident as possible. All right. And Kyle, any other advice for, uh, for the president? Free advice from a professional consultant like you? Um, I would, just to sort of piggyback on what Elaine said, I would actually say that the bar is kind of lower for Biden in the sense that expectations are probably going to be pretty low because there's this widespread belief that he's just not up to the job or whatever. And so maybe he, he actually gets kind of sort of graded on a curve. Although the, th the other the tricky thing is, is he is given to verbal misstatements. As I mentioned throughout his career, he was he was known for that. Uh, and so any little slip people will jump on because the, the bar for him is lower than certainly like an Obama for someone who is sort of known as more of a much more of an order, regardless of age. All right. When we come back after the break, we're going to shift from uh, the opportunities that Joe Biden faces to the challenges Donald Trump faces financially, legally and politically. When we come back in just a moment. All right. On the Republican side, wacky things are happening. Donald Trump recently was slapped with a monumental fine, more than $400 million for a criminal violation in the state of New York. Uh, Jacob, did this have any impact 
on his political standing? Well, uh, it remains to be seen, right? This is still kind of breaking news. I think that the the impact of the uh, decision itself is unlikely to harm his standing among certainly among Republicans and and likely among the larger electorate because we didn't really learn anything shocking or new in the course of these proceedings. It's about Trump's business. He's faced questions about his uh, business dealings and and his proclivity to uh, exaggerate and inflate the value of his assets, which is at the core of this case. Everybody, even people who like him, know that he fudges numbers all the time, that he lies, frankly, about how much money he has. Uh, and so the the political impact immediately is probably not so great, but the financial impact uh, and that $400 million uh, fine that he will have to pay or at least put up a bond for, uh, that could have a real impact. We got financial reports the other day from his campaign. They are running out of money. It costs a lot of money to run a presidential campaign and reach the voters and turn them out. And if Trump is on the hook for $400 million, and it's actually, it's a lot more than that when you factor in all of the judgments he's facing, uh, that, that could have a real impact on his ability to run a top tier professional campaign. Well, it's uh, it's fascinating. He needs all this money to run a campaign, but when his opponent uh, comes even behind, loses to no one, um, when there's no one else on the ballot, it doesn't cost that much to beat no one. Um, uh, Elaine, what happened in Nevada when Trump's opponent lost when there wasn't even anybody else on the ballot? Um, <laughs> it's kind of a crazy thing that happened in Nevada. So uh, Nevada decided this year they were going to have a primary. Um, uh, the state decided that, the state Democratic uh, legislature. Um, they they hosted a primary. Nikki Haley signed up for it. Um, but then the Re state Republican Party decided they were going to have their usual caucus. Um, and, and I think I have all this right, so please correct me if I don't. But um, the uh, the Republicans went ahead, uh, Republican Party went ahead and had a caucus that Trump participated in. Um, candidates could not participate in both. Um, and Nikki Haley had announced, you know, I'm not participating in this caucus. It's rigged for Trump. It's rigged against me. It's rigged for Trump. Um, so she participated in the primary. I think um, she was hoping for a headline that said Nikki Haley wins Nevada primary, you know, caveat, she was the only candidate running. Um, and then later Trump would win the caucus. Um, so she would benefit from uh, from that headline. Well, <laughs> as it turns out, people marked uh, none of the above, none of these candidates instead. Um, so, so it was Nikki Haley and then there was a, a, a ballot um, checkbox you could check for none of these candidates and that one um, that got like way more votes than she did. Um, and I think it was the first time that that had happened since the option was added in like 1975. Um, so this was like a very embarrassing thing for her. She had really hoped uh, to win the Nevada uh, primary and have that have that good headline, even if it meant no delegates. Um, and she didn't get that. She got an embarrassing result. Um, Trump went on to win the caucus and win uh, the state, all of the state's delegates. Um, so it was a pretty humiliating thing. Um, would it have done much for her um, had she beaten, you know, none of the above? Uh, not really, but um, I think it's 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 still sort of a funny, uh, just another quirky thing that has happened this this campaign cycle. Uh, Kyle, do you think that uh, uh, Donald Trump has an interest in having the government shut down um, uh, under Joe Biden's watch? Well, look, I mean, sometimes when these, you know, when these shutdowns have happened, the, 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 even if, if it happens under a certain president's watch, it is possible for that president to essentially blame Congress for it. Um, and also, we, you know, we saw in this this immigration package that was negotiated in the Senate, which, uh, you know, the, the Republicans undermined in part because they want to keep the immigration issue hanging over Biden's head and not give him a victory on that. But it does give the Democrats some things to talk about and say, hey, you know, we're trying to do something immigration. We got blocked by the Republicans. Hey, we wanted to keep the government open. We got blocked by Republicans. Maybe that argument works. Maybe it doesn't. Um, but there is a possibility that if there's some sort of shutdown, that, that maybe the Republicans have overplayed their hand, or at least that's what the Democrats would, would hope for. And uh, Jacob, um, uh, last word, government shutdown this spring? 
Oh gosh. Well, I don't know if it's going to happen or not, but I, I uh, uh, tend to think that uh, the, the more openly Trump or and the Republicans try and shut down the government as a political move, the more likely it is to backfire. I mean, voters uh, aren't always paying attention to the the day by day developments here, but I tend to think voters are actually pretty smart, and if they see that the what is clearly happening is that Republicans are shutting the government down in a political move, as opposed to you know concerns about spending or something like that. Uh, I think that there it, it's very possible that they will reject that, especially if as Trump has. Uh, done before, he says, blame me, right? This is what happened in the government shutdown uh, following the 2018 elections. Trump said, I will take the blame, right? And so he's liable to take credit for another shutdown, thinking it will help him when, in fact, it may actually backfire in voters' minds. All right, going out on a limb there, voters are pretty smart. All right, we're going to remember that. Uh, interesting. So, Jacob, um, uh, while Trump was dealing with his, his political and, and financial problems, he did uh, flex some muscles here in Washington and uh, almost um, single-handedly subverted a, um, uh, a very important foreign aid bill. Uh, what, what was that story and what are its implications? Clearly, Donald Trump is the leader of the Republican Party and in many ways, the, the best framework for thinking about this primary is to think of him as almost an incumbent, like an incumbent president, right? Obviously, Joe Biden is the president, Trump is not, but within the mind of the Republican Party, he still occupies the same position as president of the party. And the president has uh, immense sway over the legislative agenda. And uh, in, in this particular case, Trump made a few determinations uh, about the foreign aid, about the, the border bill that uh, Democratic and Republican senators had spent months negotiating and decided pretty openly that politically they were not advantageous for him. He came out and said, I don't want to do this border bill because I don't want to help Biden. Um, and uh his position in the Republican Party has recovered to the point where when he speaks, a solid portion of the party listens to him, especially in the House of Representatives, uh, which has uh, more members who are loyal to him, a larger portion of the caucus uh, in that House of Congress is, is going to stand up for him and fall, fall in line behind him. And so once the House came out and said, uh, these proposals are dead on arrival uh, because Trump doesn't want them to pass, the writing became clear on the Senate walls uh, that uh, they weren't going to get through that chamber, and, and so it wasn't worthwhile passing in the Senate. So, uh, look, I think that all of this just demonstrates the hold that Donald Trump still has on the Republican Party. It's the reason why he will be the nominee. It's the reason why, for this entirety of the primary, he probably uh, was always going to be the nominee. Uh, he is the undisputed leader of the Republican Party and has been for quite some time. So, Elena, we likely to see Trump wielding this influence on other big decisions over the next few months. Yeah, I think that all bets are off when it comes to what Trump is willing to do in order to further his own political uh, cause. One of his trials starts March 25th, but I think the other three have been sort of pushed back. Um, I think he's feeling sort of... I want to say sort of a little bit fancy free, a little bit able to sort of do um, exactly what he wants right now and, and sort of feel no repercussions. I mean, he's about to shed Nikki Haley. I mean, I don't know that she'll drop out anytime soon, but. Um, thank you so much, uh, Jacob Rabashkin, Elaine Godfrey and Kyle Kondik for joining us this week on Dachel Washington. Washington. In Kenneth Ledekum, Asila o istaf sarat wa khasatan tilka el mutaallaka bitaathir el intikhabat al riasia al siyas al kharajia al amerikia bi imkanakum el tawasil mai ala twitter ala hashtag inside washington o tarasaluni mubasharatan at rob satlock arakum filosbol kadam wa hatadalaka hain shukran lakum wa ila lakah